brought to you by Keynote Women Speakers in collaboration with Crystal AI. This year marks the celebration of the 107th International Women's Day on 8th of March, a day that urges women to engage and work for a more equitable world. One of the ways women can be active uh, and use their talent to provide greater opportunities to everyone is through financial independence. I am Batya Shulman, your host and moderator for today. I'm a chartered accountant and licensed financial advisor with over 23 years international banking and financial services experience. I'm also a member of Keynote. Along with three brilliant thought leaders, I will be sharing with you experiences and thoughts on financial literacy and financial independence for women of the new decade. Joining me on the virtual stage are Katia Malazi. Katia is a certified professional coach holding PCC ICF credentials, and she's the current president of the Primetime and Professional Women's Association. Deepa Swaminathan is an experienced senior financial, corporate, commercial, and technology lawyer. She is an assistant general counsel for Singtel and is best known for her work in its raining raincoats. And finally, Patricia Driver is a seasoned executive coach and corporate trainer. Patricia's work is grounded in the fields of psychology and anthropology, and her career spans across academic research, consumer insight, including senior leader roles at American Express and Millwood Brown. Patricia is also a certified money coach. We are bringing you this event today in association with Crystal AI, a global digital first private work management platform that provides comprehensive solutions for sophisticated, high net worth, first time investors, and the underserved mass affluent investor segment in the 50,000 to $5 million range. Crystal AI is powered by an unparalleled combination of advanced algorithms and investment professionals that focuses on providing personalized product and unbiased investment advice. Big shout out to Airmeet, our technology partner, an amazing platform, which we are all connected today. It is fantastic. We've got so many attendances from all over the world. We've got India, Hong Kong, Philippines, US and Singapore. Keynote Women Speakers, as you know, is the world's leading directory of female public speakers. Founded in Singapore in 2017, we are a non-profit organization run entirely by volunteers. Keynote aims to bring diversity to speaking stages around the world. They focus on diversity simply because diversity increases group intelligence. Today's session will be 60 minutes. Afterward, we will have virtual networking for 30 minutes until 6.30 p.m. Singapore time. Before we start, some housekeeping. Um, all the audience, you are muted, okay? We will allow 10 minutes Q&A at the end. So please do drop your questions in the Q&A window and we will pick them up at the end. If we run out of time, we will shall reach you out um, we shall reach out to you by email um, to answer all your questions. So 
to start off with, um, I'm going to start to share my personal journey, um, how I learned about finances and investment, my journey, some of the mistakes I made and the lessons I learned. I was born in South Africa and I moved to Sydney, Australia to go to university. I was a few months shy of my 18th birthday. My grandmother, had given me 30 USD, a traveler's check. Now this is, this is 27 years ago and I don't think you have traveler's checks anymore. So it's a long time, it makes me feel very old. Um, but I was so proud and I remember there was a bank on campus and I went and I opened up my first bank account and I deposited my 30 USD. And then I suddenly realized, this is not gonna last me very long. Time to me has always been my biggest commodity. And I was living about 20 minutes drive away from university or to catch public transport by bus, it would take me about an hour to an hour and a half. Now that's a lot, each way, now that's a long way. So I was determined to buy a car. That was my first financial goal. I wanted to buy a car. So, so what did I do? I, mean, I was 17 years old. The first thing I did was I made a plan and I was very strategic. I placed all my lectures Monday to Thursday, which gave me Friday as an extra day to work. So I got a job, I got three jobs. Fridays I worked at the muffin break, Saturdays I waitressed, and Sundays I worked in an optometrist doing data admin and customer service. I had a plan. I put a budget together. I worked very hard. I saved and I made it happen. I managed to buy myself my first car. I was so excited and, and, and looking back, it was, it was quite an ugly car, but I, I was proud. And do and you know that a goal-based approach increases your wealth more than 15%. So you can do it. Anyone can do it. I finished university. Um, I got a job at Ernst & Young. I became a chartered accountant. And then I was seconded to New York. Picture this. I'm single, in my 20s, living in New York, living my best life. Now, during my time in New York, I wasn't very good at edge saving, but I was living life. And you have to find the balance between working towards your goals and living. And even though I wasn't good at saving at that stage of my life, there were two very important things that I did. Number one, I always paid off my credit card. Now, for those Americans in the room or in the virtual room or those who have lived in America will know that in America, they love giving you credit cards. People live with debt. OK, I made sure I had one, one credit card and I paid it off every month. OK, the second thing I made sure was that I had an emergency fund. And I was single. My family were living on the other side of the world. I needed to have an emergency fund, a rainy day fund, in case something was to happen to me. So I always made sure that I had an average between four to six months of my monthly expenses in cash at the bank in case I needed it. When I was living in New York, I also started investing for the first time. I was working at Ernst & Young and one of my colleagues sitting next to me was always talking on the phone, buying and selling shares. And I always listen, used to listen to what he was doing. And um, one day at lunch, I, I spoke to him about it and I said, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to buy and sell shares the same that he was doing. Well, my investment portfolio did not do very well. But I learned lessons. And I cannot blame it on my colleague. He was a very intelligent guy, but we had very different 
risk profiles. We had very different goals. We had different views on things. So I learned not necessarily to take advice from a colleague or friend or someone else, but to understand and educate myself about what I want to invest in and investing for my goals and my objectives. When I moved back from New York, I set another goal. I wanted to buy a property. So I had to start saving again. Um, and I did. I saved up. I was very disciplined. And I built my first property. Then I was ready to invest. This time, I decided to seek out a help. I spoke to a financial advisor. I found a female financial advisor, someone who I could talk to someone who I could trust, someone who I could ask questions, and there's no such thing as a dumb question, but someone who could help me educate me to make well-informed decisions and help me on my investment journey. My grandfather was a, a very wise man, and from a very young age, he told me about the benefits of compound interest. Okay, and my grandfather always quoted Albert Einstein, and Albert Einstein said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. My life and my financial, my investment journey has evolved and changed over the years, just like life does. But I'm going to leave you with some parting advice. Um, and this advice is applicable to whether you're in your 20s, your 30s, or your 40s, whether you're male or female. Okay. The first thing is always invest for your personal financial goals and objectives. Not, not the guy sitting next to you at work or not your brother or your neighbor. What's important to you? Your investing should be working towards what you want to achieve. And not the Joneses. Forget about social media. Okay? Forget about that perfectly curated Instagram post. It's not real. And even if it is, that's not your life. Okay? So be true to yourself and, and what's really important to you. Spend less than you earn. Avoid debt. Save and invest. Start investing early, early. The power of compound interest. Diversify your investments as widely, as widely as you can. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Invest for the medium to long term. Investing has risks. Okay, so be aware of your risk profile. And, and, and don't invest in something you don't understand. If you need help, seek help, speak to someone or educate yourself. Make sure you make well-informed, educated decisions. Investing takes time and patience. And in the wise words of Warren Buffett, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. Thank you. And I would now pass on to Dipa to share her personal journey. Dipa, over to you. Thank you, Bhatia. Um, listening to you, I'm very inspired and I'm, I think, uh, reminded that I'm probably doing a lot of things wrong. And um, I should probably be in the in the um, audience segment of this talk. I feel like a bit of an imposter among all you wonderfully talented, um, you know, financial experts. I'm I'm no financial expert. In fact, my talk should probably be titled how to be independent of finances maybe that's what has been my goal um so much like Bhatia, you know i um i've always been financially independent but that's mostly because i never had a plan b when i started off i came from a very middle class background in india and i'm an only child um and my parents were too innocent to be financially savvy 
so I sort of knew fairly early on that I would have to sort of um, at some point hold the purse strings, not just for myself, but also provide uh, for my parents in some sense. Um, and I was always drawn to the law uh, just because I think I'd read a lot of Perry Mason novels. Um, and on hindsight, um, that was a good thing because, you know, when you when you choose uh, a professional course as opposed to, you know, liberal arts or some of the things, uh, you know, my kids are looking at these days, there's an advantage because the minute you come out of law school, um, you know, in all likelihood, you'll have a job and start earning. But I did take some detours even back then. Um, my boyfriend at the time, my husband now, was was doing a course in the U.S. So I took a year off from law school in India to go to Nashville, Tennessee, where I waited tables for a year. Not the most prudent, um, you know, approach if you're thinking about financial independence at some point. But I suppose that's what youth is all about. You know, you're not, you're not, uh, unlike Bhatia, I didn't really have a plan and I wasn't quite working towards it. Things largely happened by accident, I think. Um, and then when I eventually finished my first law degree at the National Law School of India University, I then moved to Singapore. I was fortunate to, to get a job, which was really very much a starter level position. But, um, and I was paid peanuts now looking back, but I think, you know, the importance of that role is now very clear to me because I had a fabulous boss who is still a very, very close friend of mine. So I suppose, um, you know, one way and, you know, one important aspect to remember through a career and at every stage of a career is that you can never really burn any bridges. You know, even a job that looks like a dead end position um, could result in something down the line that you never really anticipated. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, the story of my first boss, who's now my very dear friend. Um, so from, you know, I did, I, I stayed in that job for a couple of years um, and then I got what was probably the biggest break of, of my professional life, which was a role with, with a US law firm, which again, somewhat happened by accident. Um, and, and, you know, that's when I think, you know, my own sort of um, role towards true financial independence began. And um, I worked around the clock. I put off having kids for a very long time. Uh, I worked around the clock as an international lawyer. And then I went to Harvard to do my master's, came back, had my kids, continued working. Um, and then, uh, you know, I moved in-house and... Um, Somewhere along the way, about five, six years ago, um, I started helping migrant workers in my personal capacity. Um, I think at some point, you know, you, you know, it's great to have money and wealth and, you know, to be focused on those things. But, um, and, you know, every individual is different. Um, but in my case, um, the, the, the inner voice um, was sort of speaking more towards finding a cause to making an impact, um, you know, to doing something meaningful. And I'm sure all of us at some point, you know, have those ideas and those, those, those goals, those lofty goals. Um, in my case, I think I was fortunate that uh, what was a mere chance encounter um, eventually led to uh, my second um, uh, uh, avatar, as it were, which is as the founder of its Rain Rain Courts, which is an initiative to help migrant workers in Singapore. Um, and the reason this links back to my first boss is I had this chance encounter with a couple of these workers that I found in the rain one day on my street. I happened to take them home because I, you know, I, I, you know, I was driving past and they were standing there soaking wet and I couldn't leave them there. So I forced them to get into my car. I took them home. I gave them, you know, obviously they, you know, they sat in my front porch. We gave them some hot coffee and food and I gave them some of my husband's dry clothes to change into. And um, I took a photo of them to put on Facebook to say that employers of migrant workers should always equip them with an umbrella or a raincoat because in Singapore you never know when it rains. And um, and then I gave them my number as well. I said, if you're ever in trouble in Singapore for any reason, you want to reach out to somebody, here's my number. And as it happens, I'm a lawyer. And off they went. Um, 
And three months later, I got a call from the police to say that one of these guys had tried to commit suicide the night before. And the only number he had in his wallet was mine. So would I be willing to come and post bail for him? At that time, uh, attempted suicide was a crime in Singapore. So of course I did. I was I was grocery shopping at that time. So I just dumped my trolley. I went to the police station, posted bail for him. And then I, I worked. Uh, I wrote letters to the commissioner of police every single day for seven days to convince them that this guy wasn't a criminal. The reason he had committed suicide, as it turned out, was that his boss hadn't paid him his wages for six months. So um, luckily, my emails worked. Uh, they dropped all charges against him and this guy came back to, he remembered where I lived. He came back to thank me. He was sort of like a man reborn. And um, I was telling my boss this over lunch, my first boss, I'd met her for lunch again. Many, I mean, I keep in touch with her. She's a good friend of mine. And I was telling her the story and she said, oh, you know, I know somebody who runs this People of Singapore page. And I think this would be a great story to put on there. So I said, sure, why not? So they put that story on the People of Singapore page. It went viral. It got picked up by media. And that's how It's Raining Rain Courts was born. Um, and so now I wear these two hats. Um, I'm uh, an in-house counsel in my day job, and then I run It's Raining Rain Courts. Now, how does all of this um, you know, come back to the topic that we're supposed to be discussing here, which is financial independence? Um, and I think, you know, Financial independence can lead to many things. It can lead, obviously, to the realization of your financial goals. But in my case, it can also break you free from that sort of that cycle where you are then able to move away. You're not so wedded um, to to this need to, you know, to constantly provide that it gives you that space to maneuver out and then to do something that is truly uh, meaningful and impactful to you. So I don't constantly um, think about money, but that's just me. Um, but that in itself is a luxury, I realized, because it, it wasn't always like that. I remember when I started off, I actually had to take a personal loan from a bank to buy my first compact computer. The computer cost $2,000, but I didn't even have that amount of money. My salary wouldn't wouldn't allow it so you know i've come from there so i know you know i know the importance of not having to worry about money that how much of a luxury that is um but i suppose as um you know for, for some people financial independence might just be you know just just a wealth focused assessment uh whereas for me you know it is it has more been about being independent of financial uh, worry that um you know that and that is something that i truly cherish and so you know for anybody who is thinking about um you know wanting to doing something impactful i suppose you need to be taking care of yourself in order that you can then you know um do something for for the community. And that has largely been my journey. I'm just going to take a quick look at the time. Uh, Bhatia, will you guide me? I mean, how many more minutes do I have? Because I don't want to overshoot. Are we OK? You can wrap up in a uh, oh. few minutes. <laughs> okay, great, great. So um, I guess, um, you know, I will. Um, if anybody wants to know more about, uh, you know, myself, I don't want to ramble on too much about it's raining rain courts. This is not a charity talk. This is a this is a talk about financial independence. Um, so I don't want to sort of uh, divert the discussion too much. Um, but, uh, you know, just as a as a as a woman who um, has never had a plan B, really, um, I guess my my only advice would be uh you know to take opportunities uh you know where you can find them um and to always you know try and project out about five years because i've made mistakes by not doing that um and you know making uh, decisions in a bit of a hurry um you know the exuberance of youth can sometimes mislead you into thinking you've considered all the ramifications and then you know when you realize you hadn't it's a bit too late so you know i i would just um looking back at some of the crossroads where i myself you know, took wrong decisions. Um, I think I could have saved myself some of that trouble if I just projected out 
don't. I probably still make those mistakes um, and I'll continue making mistakes, but that's okay too. I mean, I think sometimes as women, we're also very hard on ourselves. So I guess, you know, we need to give, cut ourselves a little bit of slack. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to not always, um, you know, have the perfect decision um, in the bag, but uh, to enjoy the ride. And to those of you who are, who are thinking of doing something meaningful and impactful, my only advice there would be to start small and then you never know where you're going to end up. So I think I'll stop here and pass it back to Batia. Thank you, Deepa, for sharing your meaningful experience. And now I invite you on a journey to explore some of the most common beliefs of blocking women when it comes to managing their personal finances instead of someone else's money. Do you know that 35 years ago today, Corazon Aquino was appointed as the 11th president of the Philippines, becoming the first woman in Asia to hold the president office. Since then, there are also women in politics, at work, and generally in the society have dramatically improved. But for all the remarkable accomplishments women have made in that time, little has changed in the way we interact with money. And when it comes to navigating our finances, we are still using traditional maps. Have you ever noticed that even some of the most assertive women suddenly become shy when it comes to their own finances. What's holding them back from financial topics? There is no single answer. And the relationship between women and finance is quite complicated. In my experience working with women, I've noticed that no matter what their background is, they tend to have some kind of financial resistance making them feel insecure or preventing them from doing the right choices. There seems to be a disconnect between women's ability as achievers and their financial underachieving. The reality is we have grown up with cultural and social norms teaching us not to deal with money. For years, women have been advised to delegate their financial decisions and investments to their partners unless you have no choice but to engage with your money. Maybe for some life-changing events like a death or in my case a divorce that forced me to take sole responsibility of my finance and become independent. I graduated in economics and management from a prestigious university in my country in Milan. Despite that, I've received little education about how to manage my personal finances. Instead, I was told not to talk about money because it's not classy. Inappropriate to say I wanted to make a good salary to invest or to invest my money to take care of myself financially. The problem is, if reiterating those old patterns and models, women not only say no to own their power, but to act in their best interest and their future as they tend to live longer than their partners. Today, drawing on my experience in my coaching practice, I want to share the stories of some women who have overcome their roadblocks to become more competent and confident when engaging in, co in money conversation. I think we have time for a couple of sharing and tips. And let me start with the first one. Embrace your value. More often than not, women underestimate their value. And even if you consider yourself to be a self-assured person, it's so easy to sell yourself short. Sometimes subconsciously, because you don't want it to come across as ambitious or salesy. Take Claire, one of my clients. A capable and experienced marketeer, after the birth of a second child, she decided to quit her corporate job and become a consultant. The big issue with her was that she was embarrassed, almost scared to answer the usual questions from potential clients. How much do you charge? What's your rate? She had started her business underselling her services. Indeed, she was questioning whether the work that she was doing for the client was good enough, if the clients were happy. 
If her time was worth the amount of money she wanted to ask, the real question in her head was, am I worthy of receiving that money? The truth is, her sabotaging inner critic was not giving her the permission to make money, not helping others understanding the value of her time, skills, and experience. In our coaching, we spend time in digging into those long-standing roadblocks. After surfacing the self-limiting beliefs she had and becoming aware of them, she decided to take action. She started with baby steps, but a key commitment to change the narrative about herself. So, she chose to ask for more. And while practicing that new self, she learned that the fear of receiving more money than she really felt worthy of was slowly yet steadily declining. At the end of the day, if you don't believe your own work is valuable, why should anyone else do it for you? Now, shifting to a different environment, let me offer you a second tip. Claim your value. Do you usually speak up for a salary increase? How often do you have the courage to ask for what you want? Sometimes you think you are not paying, getting paid fairly, but you do know nothing to change the status quo. I want to share the story of another client, Michelle, an accomplished sales manager in her 40s. Last year, in a casual conversation with a new colleague, she found out he was making 20% more than her on a minor role with far less responsibility and experience. The discovery took a heavy toll on her morale. She felt betrayed. Then, after processing the grief with self-compassion, she came to the conclusion she had been an accomplice when graciously accepting the ridiculous pay rises that she was offered over the years without even thinking of challenging them. Eventually, she decided the time to be nice was over. We focus on preparing a solid case as women are rejected more often when asking for a rise. She quantifies her accomplishment and we practice the talking. She put together the documentation to prove she was underpaid. And when feeling comfortable, she asked her boss to discuss and negotiate the compensation for the first time in her life. I invite you to rethink your level of risk and find the courage to become a powerful role model for the women of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our last speaker, Patricia, over to you. Thanks so much, Katia, and that was very inspiring. And I'm gonna pick up on some of those themes in my talk. So um, I'm just going to really start with, um, you know, how I, came, how I started my own wealth journey. And really for me, um, I hadn't thought about money really ever as a, as a student. I mean, I came from a middle-class background, but it just wasn't that important. I was uh, very academically inclined. I wanted to be a professor. And so it wasn't really until um, 1991 when I had within the space of, I think 22 months, graduated from university, moved to the UK, got married, started my first job, had my first baby, and the UK went into recession. And that for me was, I think, really the impetus to start paying attention, um, particularly when I had this new beautiful baby and I really just wanted to give her the world. So um, I actually have my very first budget from 1991, so this paper is 30 years old. Um, as you can see, it's nothing glamorous. It's a just piece of paper with handwriting on it. But this for me really was um, the anchor and the cornerstone of how I began my, began my wealth journey. And, you know, I still budget today. So that was my first one. And I guess uh, this is actually going to be my last one. This is the draft of our future retirement budget. So, you know, overall, back to your mentioned planning, I'm a very big believer in the power of planning. And really, you know, it's not about accumulating masses of wealth. It's really about that financial independence that we're talking about. So what I'd like to do now Let's just take a few minutes and really quickly bust through a few myths. So these were things that I had originally believed to be true. And over the years as an investor, I learned they're not true. So the first one, um, the first thing that I believed is that you can only become wealthy if you earn a lot. And this is certainly what I thought when I was in my first job and not earning very much. 
um, and believed it for several years. But then in 1998, and this is when I was working in customer insider market research for a very large global financial company, and we were developing a high-end product for some of our, for our wealthiest customers all over the world. And one of my colleagues gave me a copy of this book, it was actually this copy, um, called The Millionaire Next Door. And it had been printed two years before this in 1996. So I read this book um, and it was very interesting and it matched a lot of the things that we were seeing in our own research. So it was written by two academic researchers who had set out to discover how people became wealthy. And it's actually the largest study of its kind ever. It was in the US. And the key takeaways from the book, I think I found very personally impactful. So the first thing was that they had to try and find millionaires. So what they did was they started with very upscale neighborhoods in the US, and then they discovered something very odd. So people in these areas looked wealthy. They had very expensive homes. They drove expensive cars. They looked very rich. But when they dug underneath the surface, they realized that they weren't. So what they found were these people were high earners, but they were also high spenders. And in fact, the real millionaires, once they found them, lived in normal neighborhoods and many were in average paying jobs. And the key thing here is how they got wealthy was really just a couple of things. Um, But I think, you know, more than that, it really proved very clearly to me that wealth is just not the same as income. So income is really just what you earn, but wealth is what you keep and it's what you grow. And for me, you know, this was a very good reminder also. And it was at a, at a point when I think we'd had our twins, we now have five children. It was a very good reminder to um, not fall into the trap of spending money on things that are just symbols of wealth and rather to focus on the long term and the goal, which is, as I've talked about for me, was really about financial independence and financial security. Okay, so the second myth I wanna talk about is I really believed that in order to be a successful investor, I'm gonna talk specifically about investing now, that you really needed to have a degree in economics or accounting or finance. And the, the turning point for me on this came during the global financial crisis. This was 08, 09. And very few economists, so this is the first thing I noticed, was I was looking around and reading everything, and I realized that very few economists or investment gurus had actually seen it coming. Um, and there was so much drama, and there was also so much disagreement on how it would end and what would end it. Would there be a double dip? I think somebody, you know, people were recommending running to gold, that the dollar was going to be destroyed, blah, blah. And so as much as I found it very worrying, because we had invested in the market at the time, and I also was managing our investments, I actually found it really fascinating. Um, there was so much drama, and I remember in 08 turning to my husband and saying, you know, I actually think that my psychology degree might be a bit more relevant to investing than your economics one. And so now this is really, you know, a topic for me on its own, um, and I can talk for hours about this, but I only have a few minutes. So I guess what I'd like to say is that we're often told to be rational investors. And I would counter argue and say, actually, there really is no such thing. Um, so it's better to not even pretend. You know, what I've seen through my years of coaching and my years of interviewing wealthy individuals and my research job is that money is really one of the most emotional topics there is. And that we are all driven by our fears, beliefs, biases, ingrained patterns. And a lot of times we aren't even aware of them. Um, and I don't have time to go into this now, but it's a fascinating topic. And, you know, just to say that I, I live and breathe this stuff, I read a lot, but still, you know, even for myself, managing my own tendencies, and I know what they are, is really tricky. And so last year, and I think if anyone who was investing last year and even now, you know, it's been a time of tremendous volatility. And I remember last year just having to absolutely coach myself around my own emotions. And I remember March 12th, and if you don't recall, that was the day when the S&P dropped 9.5% in a single day, which was the largest fall, one day fall since 1987. And it continued to fall in the days after that. And, you know, so I just spent a lot of time reminding myself the things that, 
you know, it's funny because you know about the fear and greed cycle or, or if you don't look it up. And one of the things is when you're in the middle of it, it's still really hard to see past it. Um, and what I found actually was I just stopped listening to all of the pundits on the news and spent a lot of time doing mindfulness meditation. That was probably the best thing for me at the time, just to sort of calmly get through that period. So, you know, this topic of emotions, I think, is quite an interesting one because as women, you know, we're often told we're very good dealing with emotions. It's something we spend a lot of time on. So I actually think this is something that can really help us here. I'm convinced, and this is not just for women, this is for all of us. I'm very convinced that for all of us, understanding and managing our emotions is one of the most important skills when it comes to money and to investing. Okay, um, the third myth, and I believe this for quite a long time, is that men are just naturally better investors than women. And thinking about uh, you know, what Katya mentioned, I think a lot of us just do intuitively think this or intrinsically think this. So I want to just blow this myth out of the water. I mean, first of all, one of probably the most well-known investors today, and she's become well-known only very recently, is a woman called Kathy Wood. And she's the founder and head of ARK Invest. And last year, she ran the largest actively managed fund in the world. And that's a title that I think she took from JP Morgan. And she was named by Bloomberg as the best stock picker. So, you know, first of all, there you go. But Kathy's not alone. There are a lot of other um, very, very good, well-known female investors. And moreover, a number of studies have shown, and this is time and time again, that female investors actually tend to outperform men. Now, there are a number of reasons for this, but it's at least partly because women tend to trade a lot less frequently, so they're not as frequent traders, and they also avoid very risky bets. Um, and to pick up what Katya said, you know, I've also seen a lot of very bright, accomplished women tell me that they feel daunted when it comes to this area. And one of the things I think that um, puts people off, so not just women, is just some of the materials that you get from your advisors. And people have said to me, you know, they come with all these charts and they look really complicated. Um, and often, you know, honestly, I think they make, some advisors make things sound a lot more complicated than they really need to be. Um, so here's what I would say on this one, you know, there's that old joke about men don't ask for, for directions and women do. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but what I would say is if we are okay asking for directions, let's make sure that we're okay with asking questions. And there's really, in the world of investing, no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to managing your very hard earned money. And uh, just remember also that nobody is ever going to care more about your financial well-being than you do. And I've got one last, one last myth I'd like to talk about. And this is something that um, quite a few of my friends have said, and, and family actually, people who are very near and dear to my heart. And what they say is that they don't want to invest is because it's not in line with their values. So part of this is that they don't want to invest in companies that they feel are destructive, they're worried about the planet, worried about people. And, you know, I really do get this and I have a lot of heart for it. Um, and what I would say is, you know, years ago, it was actually very difficult as an investor to figure out what you had in your investment products. It was very opaque. And this is before, you know, now we have things like digital wealth platforms for the average customer where you can actually see what your money is in. And even things like ETFs, you know, you can look at every ETF out there and look at what is inside of them. So first of all, you can actually know what you're investing in. Um, and even more fortunately today, the fastest growing investment sector is ESG investing. So investors more than ever are now looking very heavily at environmental, social and governance factors. And by the way, Asia is attracting actually the lion's share of these dollars right now. So it used to be that, you know, ESG sounded good, but people were worried about the returns because they weren't as great. And 2020 was, if you haven't heard this, an absolute breakout year for ESG investing because ESG investments outperformed many of the other investments. So for those of you who I think are very concerned about these, there are now lots and lots of options and these are only growing. The other thing that um, people have said to me is, you know, well, money's not really that important. As long as I have enough, I'm fine. 
And, you know, here's the thing, and Deepa alluded to this, you know, it's good to have a plan B, number one. And there are also a lot of stats out there that we just really have to pay attention to. So overall, um, you know, women tend to earn less than men, take time off to raise children, and we are living longer. So it's really important for us to be able to look after ourselves. And yes, I'll be the first to say that money doesn't buy happiness, but it does make things a whole lot easier. So I'm just going to leave you with one last thought. If you get very, very good at investing and it bothers you and you make a whole pile of money, remember that you don't have to keep it all. So as Deepa has highlighted, there are a lot of worthy places for it to go to. Um, so thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Batia for a bit more of a dialogue with everybody. Thank you, Patricia. And while you're on screen, I'm going to ask you the first question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Thank you, ladies, um, for your, your journeys and your very interesting and, and heartfelt stories. Um, so, Patricia, first question to you. Um, 2020 was an unprecedented year. Um, so much uncertainty and unpredictability. How do you think the um, pandemic impacted women and wealth? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a great question, Bautia. Unfortunately, and I, I think you've probably seen the same data as me, um, the data we're seeing shows us that COVID has actually hit women disproportionately harder when it comes to work and saving, and that's including in Southeast Asia. So just all over the world, and as we all remember, a lot of women had to take on the brunt of the homeschooling and childcare. And this was actually even in cases where they were the higher earner. And I think Citigroup has found that um, about, they think about $1 trillion can be lost, could be lost from global growth um, last year as women fell out of the workforce during the pandemic. So unfortunately, after many years, it's really so important. I think it's incredibly important that we increase financial literacy for women and, and for everybody, really. Um, you know, many people don't have the luxury of learning from their lessons, so putting money in and making mistakes. We've got to find a way of very quickly helping people increase their financial literacy. And I think, you know, as women as well, and for those of us who are interested in this topic, I think just to reach out to other women and really try and support each other um, during this period, but also in this journey of financial literacy. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patricia. You're welcome. Katya, um, I'm gonna ask you the next question. Um, what do you think that some of the key steps that women need to start taking to become financially independent and successful in this post-pandemic world? Hmm. Thank you, Batia. Unfortunately, I have to echo what Patricia was saying just uh, before on the fact that this pandemic uh, had a much worse impact on women than in, on men. And not just, not just because of the fact that women have been taking care of additional responsibility at home, but also about childcare and, um, and homeschooling. I mean, we were all in the same boat in uh, April and, and May last year, but also because during that time, women have lost more jobs than men. And you know that uh, there is uh, this uh, quite often the quoted statistics saying that uh, women tend to apply for a job when they see that they can meet 100% of the requirements of a job, while men tend to uh, apply for exactly the same job if they see that they can meet 60 or 70% percent of the requirements. A more recent observation from LinkedIn I found that while women and men have viewed the same job post during the last year, women have applied for less, much less jobs in the same period. So my invite and maybe it would be the only invite would be go back if you are outside of the workforce, go back as soon as you can and start to be financially uh, independent as soon as you can. And uh, some other tips I could offer women uh, to find uh, this uh, new confidence to put yourself in the driver's seat of your life is uh, 
Something I ask always my uh, clients to do, make a list of your accomplishments. Because when you think about what you have already achieved in the past, you can see what you can do again in the future. And that's very powerful. And the second thing would be um, take some risk, go outside of your comfort zone, and maybe also um, upskill, because that will be a request in this quickly evolving world we are in at the moment. Thank you very much. Deepa, I'm going to ask you the next question. How do you think women can become more financial literate and educate themselves to make better, well-informed financial decisions? Well, um, okay, I don't know if I'm the best place to answer this question. Um, but, you know, as someone who doesn't come from a coaching background or doesn't come from a banking or financial literacy background like the rest of you, um, you know, speaking for myself, um, you know, one great way to learn is actually by making mistakes. Um, that's how I did. I remember when I first got my job um, at, at, at a US law firm, um, I used to get these calls from these two guys who sounded, you know, very polished, very Western. They were calling me from Indonesia and they were selling me these stocks. And I was, I don't know, maybe 27, 28. And, I, you know, I was suddenly earning a very, very handsome salary. And these guys would call me. And I thought I'd ask them smart questions. After all, I'm a lawyer. And um, I was sold. And I, you know, invested, I don't know, $30,000 or something like that, which is not a small amount of money when you're in the first or second year of your career. Never saw it again. They sent me all the stock documents. I don't even know whether those companies existed. It's just that I couldn't believe that, you know, you could be called in your office by somebody sounding so savvy and selling you something that sounded so good. Um, and then you could, you know, you could lose money. So I very quickly learned after that. And I think, Bhatia, you um, alluded to this in your opening comments when you said that be clear about your goals. You're not investing for somebody else. You're not doing for you know, you're not doing it for the guy in the next office. I think that is what, um, you know, is at the core of it is that you and there's no substitute for hard work. If you want to invest in something, I think you need to do your homework. You need to understand, you know, for yourself um, what the risks are, what the payouts, what the potential payouts are. And then you also need to to take stock of what could happen if, if something goes wrong. And I think if you kind of start that way, um, you know, then you can sort of build your own path towards understanding, um, you know, what what works for you and what doesn't. But I, I believe that mistakes are probably going to be your best and most memorable teachers along the way. Thank you very much, Deepa. So, Women, women like to talk about many things, um, but there's still generally a taboo when it comes to talking about money and wealth. And do you know that 61% of women would rather talk about their own debt than talk about money? That's horrific. So ladies, what can we start doing to start opening up the conversations and making women feel more comfortable and confident to talk about money. Um, I'm opening it up. Anyone who wants to um, talk about this? Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, pick, up on, I'll pick up on your, um, you mentioned confidence. And um, I think that this is sort of, this is an interesting topic because Katya just referenced about in the job world how women won't apply unless they have all of the all of the skills. And you know, I remember when I was years and years ago being very taken by one of the findings that I saw in my psych course, which was that you know when men succeed on a task, they tend to attribute it to their own skill, and if they flail, they blame it on the task on bad luck. Women think they're lucky when they succeed, and they blame themselves when they fail. So I think we are all dealing with this thing of you know lack of confidence. The one thing I would say is honestly, so I I think confidence is important, and I personally think that that financial literacy is the way to it. 
um, helping people to understand how the market works and helping women to set longer term goals, the things you've been talking about, and you know, to, to look at the different options and to really understand what these things are. But I guess what I would say is I actually I actually quite like having not total confidence because the one thing I know is that overconfidence is actually a danger when it comes to investing. And that overconfidence leads to trading, which leads to not as much success. So I would say confidence is, is great, but also I think keeping yourself grounded and realizing that, you know, none of us are none of us can see the future, right? So even advisors, if they tell you they know what's gonna happen, don't buy it. No one knows what's coming next. So I think actually feeling a little bit uncertain and uncomfortable is good in this because it will mean that you keep on seeking out new information. Um, so I don't know if I really answered that. I guess I would say is, is confidence is important, but we don't want to have too much. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone want to add, Katia? Yes. It, to complement uh, what Patricia just shared, I think that uh, one thing we could do uh, because of this uh, taboo is um, maybe to admit or to accept that we have a kind of dysfunctional or unhealthy relationship with money and decide to improve that relationship as we would do with any other relationship that uh, that we have in our life and uh, in order to do that uh, usually the first step is uh, to recognize the taboo to recognize uh, your limiting beliefs and then uh, once you are aware of them when you see them you, you when you can recognize them you can decide if you want to act on them or if you can if you want to leave the situation as it is I know that this is easier said than done, also because I remember, I think it was the University of Cambridge was saying that uh, the money beliefs are formed by the age of seven in your family of origin, and therefore it's very difficult to change them, but not impossible. It takes courage, it takes uh, really the, the, the willingness to change the situation, but, uh, but you can change the narrative that you have about yourself and the way you see yourself in this relationship if you are ready to accept that and not to try to, to deny that you have issues with money. If you deny, the problem just become bigger and bigger. But if you decided to accept that, it's a different story. Excellent. Thank you. We have a question from the, um, the audience. Um, thank you, Josh, for asking the first question. And it is, what's one piece of financial advice you would impart to a 9 to 12 year old? So I'm going to answer that question because I've got three young boys and nine years old indeed. And Obviously, I'm a financial advisor, so all my kids, they hear me all the time talking about money, talking about wealth, talking about saving. But what I've done for them is we've got three jars at home. One's for saving, one's for spending, and one's for sharing. So the saving money, they've learned about compound interest, and, and they watch how they coin that, and they get so excited to see the jar filling up. The second jar is for spending. You know, they, they earn up a lot of money. They, they buy an Easter egg last week or they buy a Nintendo game or whatever it is. Um, but they feel proud because they've earned it. And the third jar is about sharing. And I've taught my kids that we're very fortunate and that we need to give back to others. And so I think from a very young age, they need to know that people are less fortunate than them and how important it is to give and share. So it's not one thing, but it's three things. But it's, I, I'm a very big believer in, in instilling good financial education to children. And the younger, the better. And that wraps up today's session. So thank you all very much for attending today's webinar. Um, you've been a fantastic audience. Um, we have recorded this, so we'll email it to you. Um, Keynote would like to take the opportunity to thank the team at Crystal AI for this wonderful collaboration. It's been fun. And um, we would also like to thank Ms. Damayanti Shahani, um, she's the Chair Impact Committee, 100 Women in Finance Singapore, for being the catalyst for connecting Keynote and Crystal AI. So now we're all going to be re redirected 
to the social lounge for 30 minute networking session. So all the speakers and all the audience, we can all get together and we can network and we will automatically be redirected. Um, so thank you and see you there now.